Moving house is surely one of the most stressful things that you can do, and a whole host of superstitions have sprung up to dictate everything from which day you move, to what you take into the new house first, and how to ensure good luck once you're there. There are even some superstitions that can guide which direction you should move in when you're choosing a new home. These superstitions do seem to provide a way to control a situation that otherwise might seem like it's getting rather out of hand. So let's take a look at some of these superstitions and traditions in this week's episode of Fabulous Folklore. Hello there and welcome to Fabulous Folklore, the podcast for all things folklore, occult and just a bit weird. I'm your host, Icy Sedgwick, blogger, fantasy author and your guide into these rather mysterious realms. I've got some rare things to show you, so come on in, take a look around, but be careful not to touch anything. These things sometimes bite. Well, hello there and welcome back to Fabulous Folklore with me, your host, Icy Sedgwick. We are into the final weekend of August, which is the bank holiday weekend here in the UK. And we're finishing off the Folklore of Life Stages month as well. I do want to point out before I forget that we are actually going to have a look at the Folklore of Trees again next month because I thought, obviously, as we're coming into autumn, you often get a new appreciation of trees. So we're going to be having a look at some of the big mighty ones like the oak and the willow and the ash and so on. So if you've got a specific tree that you'd like to hear more about, obviously, please do feel free to let me know. But that is what we're going to be doing next month, just so you know. So we are going to basically just dive right into this episode because there's a fair bit to cover. And I did sort of figure that most people will probably have moved house at least once even if it's just something like going away to university and going and living in halls of residence or something like that or whatever it might be. And it is often cited as being one of the most stressful things that you can do. And it is a massive process because you've got to actually view houses, then you've got to pack all your stuff up and you realise that you've got way more than you ever thought you had. And then you've actually got to move all that stuff to a new house and then you've got to find homes for everything once you get there. It is a bit of a nightmare. And I remember when I first moved out of London, it was quite funny because I managed to fit everything I was taking with me into the back of the car. And then when I moved to my next flat a year later, it was five car loads. And then when I moved to another flat, I needed to have an actual van. So basically, I've just accumulated more and more stuff over the years. And yes, when I moved from London back to Newcastle, that was incredibly stressful because you're then adding the whole getting to the other end of the country into the process. So it is unsurprising that such a noteworthy life stage would have a host of superstitions and traditions attached. Many cultures do have different approaches, but in this particular episode, I have chosen to stick to ones from the British Isles because I could actually verify them. But it's also a lot of these have then spread to other places as well. So I did find some of them among superstitions that people in the US follow and Australia and so on as well. So hopefully there'll be something familiar in here. And I did decide to try and verify some of them, but also collect new traditions by asking the question on Twitter. And I literally just asked, did any of you follow any traditions or superstitions when you moved house? So I will be embedding some of the answers throughout this episode. Now, some of the respondents were outside of the British Isles, which did show how widespread some of the traditions are. And I did actually find that some of the things people replied with were really interesting, but they were closer to apotropaic measures for just general protection of the house rather than something that you would do to move into a new house specifically. So I've focused on the ones that are about moving into a new house instead. But the other ones are still really interesting and I'll no doubt use them at some point in the future. So we're going to start off with superstitions to bring luck and... Most people seem to consider Thursday the best day to move house and Sunday is also a good choice. Personally, when I moved back from London, I came back on a Thursday, but that was purely because a lot of my stuff was going into storage and that was the only day that the storage place was open past a certain time. But anyway, that's a side issue. Friday and Saturday are considered the least lucky days to move house and there's also a rhyme to explain the lack of luck in choosing a Saturday, which is a Saturday flit means a short sit. When I mentioned this episode to my mother, she actually said that she'd heard one similar about a Friday, which was a Friday shift means a short sit. And my mother used to be a legal secretary who did a lot of work around conveyancing and obviously people think they're completing on houses and stuff like that. 
and she always thought it was a bad idea to complete on a Friday because if anything does go wrong there's nobody that you can then speak to over the weekend to get anything sorted out whereas obviously if you do it on Thursday you've at least got another working day in hand so there is potentially a practical reason why a Thursday is better than a Friday or indeed a Saturday. Now, some people think that having rain on moving day is supposed to bring good luck, whereas others think that it's bad luck to move house when it rains. Personally, I would think it would just be a little bit more irritating to try and move house in the rain, but there we go. One superstition also advises moving house during a waxing moon, if possible. And when you move in, you can open the shutter facing east first, which should guard against storms. There was an Irish tradition that you left your house through the door you entered on your first day in the property and failure to do so would bring bad luck. And then elsewhere I found another one that said you can always count the corners of each room on the first day you move in to bring good luck. Over on Twitter, people put up horseshoes above the door used most often as their means of bringing good luck into the property. In some traditions, bringing bread and salt into a new house means that owners will always have plenty of food and their lives will have plenty of flavour. And indeed, you may have remembered that particular tradition because it's actually used in It's a Wonderful Life. And another tradition recommends taking bread and salt into each room. And some people also recommend using coal, which brings warmth, and then salt to represent life's flavour. But Coralyn Daniels says that you should actually throw the salt into the house before you walk in to drive out evil spirits. Bearing in mind she was writing in 1903. Elsewhere, people scatter salt in each room to deter evil spirits. And I should point out that one respondent on Twitter actually said that they used to hear indistinct chatter downstairs during the night, which always seemed quite joyous. They then mentioned this to someone who unfortunately scattered salt in the house and now no one has heard the chatter since. So you do have to wonder what exactly has been moved along, shall we say, by the use of salt. Now, there were quite a lot of responses around moving house and broomsticks. And essentially, the whole idea is that you're supposed to leave your broom in your old house and then buy a new one for your new house. Now, some people say this is because brooms get attached to houses. Other people say that you don't want to take old dirt, both literal and figurative, into a new house. Now, apparently this does only apply to brooms used for cleaning, whereas those used for magical purposes are quite happy to move house. Now, when I did ask about these superstitions on Twitter, one respondent did actually do this. They did get rid of their old broom, bought a new one and actually tossed the new broom into the house first. And as well as leaving the old broom behind, Coral and Daniels also advises burning any dishcloths or cleaning cloths because that way you won't carry bad luck with you from one house to the next. I did find another one that said that you shouldn't take mops from one house to the next. And I remember I used to, obviously I've got like a mop with a detachable head, so I would just throw the old head out and get a new one for the new flat. But I think, again, that was more just the fact I was like, well, I'd quite like to use a new one on the nice clean floors rather than my old nasty one. Now, a related superstition actually directs you to burn your old broom in the corner. Obviously, the superstition does actually recommend that you keep watch over it, which is probably quite a good idea, as you don't want to burn down your old house as well. But the idea is that you shouldn't move the old broom with your household furniture, or it will only bring a lack of success. And William Carroll advises that you should actually throw a broom over the house before you go inside to bring good luck. Now, obviously, that's going to be much easier if you have a bungalow. But if you're, say, moving into like a fourth floor flat in a massive block, that's going to be a little bit more difficult for you to achieve. One of the really strange superstitions that I came across, and this was a much older one, is that you shouldn't take your cat with you because she'll only bring bad luck. And if you leave her behind for the new owners, she'll bring them good luck instead. And Randall V. Mills guesses that this is because the cat knows the mouse holes in your old house, but she doesn't know them in your new house. And all I can say is don't do this. Take your pets with you. For one thing, it you know your pet is a member of the family. And secondly, there's no guarantee that the people moving in want your cat. So please take your cats with you when you move. Coraline Daniels actually advised that you should throw something alive into a new house because the first to enter is the first to die. She suggests an animal, but I would say this is a tradition that we can probably safely ignore because in a lot of cases, the first person into a house will be one of the removal men. So I think that we're probably safe to say that one's nonsense. So this is all about taking things into the new house or throwing things into the new house. And there is a lot of the folklore around gifts for the new house so things that you should take into the house to guarantee what you'll then have in future and William Carroll says that you should take food into the house first so that you'll always have food in the home 
And then he also says that your first visitor should bring cake, so life in the house will be sweet. I would say that any visitor should bring cake, but I have an incredibly sweet tooth. Another superstition actually disagrees with Carol and says that you should take a Bible into your new house as the first item. And indeed, one Twitter respondent actually said that a Catholic priest came to their house and did a house blessing. Now, it is always a good idea to bring gifts for the house spirits in your new home. And some sources recommend common items like bread, honey, cream, salt or wine. Others recommend that you can light candles. And, and one respondent did note that she used sage to cleanse the house from top to bottom. Now, Althea Sebastiani makes the argument that it's actually a little bit rude to do a smoke cleanse in a new house because obviously the house spirits were there first and cleansing to get rid of them could be counterproductive. It could either annoy them because they might see that as being a bit rude or it may move on some of the, the smaller ones that actually weren't going to be problematic anyway. She does, however, give suggestions for a gentle cleansing that's a good way to introduce yourself to the resident house spirits. So I will link to that article below if that is something that you're interested in doing. One Twitter respondent actually said that they put out bread with milk and honey at night to entice a good spirit to move in. And another respondent, and I love this because there's a picture, noted that she made her own Sheila Nagig to ward off evil spirits. And it was a very, very good Sheila Nagig, and I just thought that was quite cool. And one of the other respondents hung a gargoyle outside the front door. So it was quite cool how many people sort of put things up outside or in the house sort of to chase away harm. But speaking of house spirits, and incidentally, if you are interested in house spirits, the July bonus episode for Patreon supporters was on the history of house spirits. So if you want to learn more about them, you can become a, a supporter at the £3.50 a month tier and you'll be able to get access to that episode and 20 episodes before it. So there's a fair bit of content to get through with the exclusives. Anyway, according to Richard Webster, a housewarming wasn't simply the chance to show off a house to friends and family. It was actually a ritual that involved the house spirits. And when people moved house, they would take embers from the old hearth to start a fire in the new hearth. And this was actually the means by which they took the spirits with them to the new house. Now, I should point out that not all house spirits are particularly helpful. And in some legends, we have the brownie, which is also known as the hob in northern England. And these creatures might leave your kitchen and indeed other parts of the house in disarray if you've left it neat and tidy. But if you leave it in chaos, they'll straighten everything up for you. Personally, I can't see the problem with the latter, but for some brownies were hard work to have around and you could persuade them to leave by giving them a gift of clothing. Yet despite this, Donald Archie MacDonald actually notes the existence of an entire Scottish story type around moving house and it's categorised as F30 and in the story type, a farmer moves house to escape a brownie only to find it sitting in the back of the cart. Other versions do exist in which families seek to escape glaze digs, bokans and other supernatural creatures and in some stories the creature actually arrives at the new house before them, not just travelling with them. Now obviously this does contrast with the rituals that ensure house spirits go with you but it also attests to the variety and tales associated with house spirits. And of course, there is also the idea of the house itself as a defined space or entity. And I really like the Twitter response that said that they did lots of cleansing and lots of talking to the house. I narrate things to my house a lot, especially in the beginning when I'm getting to know a new space and establishing that sense of trust and safety with my surroundings. So I'd say stuff like, all right, I'm going to sweep the floors. So here the respondent is forming a dialogue with the house while they clean as part of the settling in period. Now, how do you actually choose where to buy a new house? Well, William Carroll actually suggests a good rule of thumb, and I quote, When you hear the call of the first turtle dove of spring, the direction from which the sound comes will be the direction in which you will move, end quote. Now, that might be a little bit difficult to do if you don't have turtle doves in your area, or indeed if you want to move some time of the year that's not spring, but it's worth bearing in mind. And as for selling houses, there was also a tradition that you could follow for that as well, because one of my Twitter respondents said that they'd actually buried a statue of St. Joseph to help the old house sell, but they did note that they forgot to dig him up again when they moved. Now, other traditions among the Twitter responses in particular were harder to quantify, and one person said that they were always too stressed to worry about superstitions, but they did have a tradition of having a chippy tea in the new house on the first night, which is a mighty fine tradition indeed. I think every time I've moved house, my first meal in that house has always been pizza. And I think that's just because I really like pizza. But yeah, that's the thing I can always remember doing. 
Another reply said, and I quote, The only thing I've ever done is to butter the cat's paws. It's supposed to help them know that the new house is home because it makes them lick their paws and a cleaning place is a safe place, end quote. And another person actually replied to say that they'd done the same thing. So I'm fascinated to know how many people who move with cats have actually done that. Somebody else said, I don't know if this tradition reaches outside of my family, but my grandmother always said the first thing you should do when you move is make your bed. So I've always done that when I moved. And I can absolutely see the logic of that tradition because obviously when you've had a really long day of moving boxes, unpacking things, you're generally trying to get organised, being able to climb into a bed that's ready for you to be there would certainly be a nice way to end the day. Another respondent actually replied to say that they'd found a pound coin pushed into a slit in a cork in a cupboard and for some this was actually a homemade talisman meant to bestow luck and prosperity on whomever the bottle of champagne was open for. Others think this tradition brought good luck to everyone who was at the event and in another version pushing silver coins into a champagne cork was a wedding day memento for the couple. Now, finding such an item is no bad thing because, as Coraline Daniel says, you should also leave money behind in the house that you're leaving. And this can be as little as a penny, but it brings good luck to whoever comes after you and then deters bad luck for yourself. You might, of course, encounter other items left behind by previous occupants. One Twitter respondent said, I moved into a flat that had conkers on every windowsill. I lived in fear of whatever demons it was that they were warding off. Turns out it was against spiders. Bin the conkers. Now, obviously, we did talk about the conquer practice last year among the autumn superstitions. So there is that episode if you're interested in knowing more about deterring spiders with conkers. Incidentally, in one of the flats I moved into, we discovered that you could actually get into this weird crawl space in the roof through a cupboard in the upstairs bedroom. It was very, very odd. And in there, there was just this weird collection of stuff. Like there was a, I think there was a Sky TV dish. There was an empty first aid box. There was a high-vis vest. It was just people had obviously just shoved stuff in there that they didn't really have any use for, and there was just this massive accumulation of just random nonsense. So I don't think any of that had any folkloric meaning, but I just thought at some point in the future, someone will find this and just think, what on earth? But anyway, what do we actually make of these moving house superstitions? Well, it's hardly surprising that people would devise rituals and traditions around moving house because stressful occasions can always lead people to look for ways to find some element of control over what's happening. But our homes are also our primary source of shelter. It's understandable that we'd want to find ways to befriend them and ensure good luck while we live in them. They are also often quite an investment whether that's in terms of paying rent or indeed a mortgage. So again you're going to want to try and maximise all of your time and energy while you're there. So what I want to know is what traditions did you follow when you moved house, if any? It can be something as simple as whatever you always have as a first night tea. It could be something as simple as things that you always take or the first thing that you unpack, things like that. I'm just fascinated to see sort of what traditions people also have within their own families. Because remember, folklore is not just simply what is written down and then passed on. It's also what we actually do within our families and more personal traditions and rituals as well. So if you do want a reply, obviously you can post a comment on the blog post this episode is for and the link is in the show notes. You can tweet me, you can leave a comment on my Facebook page, you can message me on Instagram, all the links are below. You can also email me as well, which is icy at icysedgwick.com if you so desire. That is the end of our folklore of life stages though. Like I say, we are going to be moving on to the folklore and myths and legends of trees next month because obviously, as I say, September is the beginning of autumn really in the UK so it's a good time to start thinking about trees and so on. And the Patreon special bonus episode for this month is the history of land spirits. And I'm also doing the illustrated talk for the £5 a month supporters tomorrow, which is about Penny Dreadfuls and how three particular characters either became legendary because of their Penny Dreadful, how the Penny Dreadful actually influenced popular culture or how people actually thought that they were real because they didn't realise that they were actually in a Penny Dreadful. Sweeney Todd is the one that I'm thinking of there. So basically, yeah, we are looking at Spring Heel Jack, Sweeney Todd and Varney the Vampire. So if you do want to get access to that, obviously you can become a supporter and you'll be able to either watch it live on Sunday or watch the recording through Patreon later. So without any further ado, remember it is also Rural Gothic this weekend. It would be wonderful to see you there. We've got talks on grief in horror films. We've got Egyptian mummies in literature and film. 
We've got a history of heathenry. We've got folklore in the Scooby-Doo universe, which is why I'm going to be hosting Dressed as Velma. So again, I'll put the link in the show notes and it would be brilliant to see some of you there. So I hope you have a marvellous weekend. If you're in the UK, enjoy your bank holiday on Monday and I will see you next week when we have a look at the folklore of oak trees. Cheerio. Well, thank you for listening and thanks for visiting Fabulous Folklore. I hope you enjoyed your stay. If you did, why not consider subscribing in your podcast app of choice? If you enjoy the show, why not leave me a review and help other listeners to find it as well? And if you'd like bonus exclusive episodes of the podcast, then why not support me on Patreon? It does help me to keep the show going and it means that you get a little bit extra every month as well. And you can find all of the necessary links in the show notes below. So without any further ado, I will bid you adieu and I hope that you have a safe travels wherever you're going on to next.